Aloha. Welcome back to Don't Just Age Engage on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Grimm. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the question, do you hear what I hear? Or auditory uh, changes in aging. And we have as our guests, Ms. Lisa Sales and Mr. Robert Dusignal from, uh, from a very good company that are are uh, going to represent their products, but also we'll look into what it is to age and how we deal with, uh, how we uh, encounter age in our aging auditory changes. Welcome, Lisa and Robert. Thank you so much for joining me here today. It's really wonderful to have us. your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. You're for welcome. Um, I'd like to begin just giving our audience viewers an opportunity to get to know you a little bit about your well, your your career, your your uh, history. Tell us, uh, Lisa. Would you first tell us something of your story, of um, of of your work and your service and your life here on the on the island? I moved to the island a couple of years ago. However, I've been with Miracle Ear for oh well over twenty years, and I've been in practice uh, much longer than that. Um, I myself am very hearing impaired, as is my husband. Um, I have uh, two degrees in the field. And she has really does have great skill and, and uh, abilities, and she's very effective and efficient. Robert, this is my first opportunity to meet you face to face, so to speak, these days. And um, yes, sir, would would love to hear a little bit more about for our viewers of, of your journey. Uh, sure. I actually have a background in healthcare, uh, going back to coming out of high school and into college. Initially, I started my career working in X-ray and in uh, CAT scan. So, uh, got the transition into hearing because uh, Lisa and I actually have a, a mutual friend, uh, Aaron Toth, who's uh, uh, an owner in the industry and has worked with Miracle Ear for several years as well. And um, upon me getting uh, ready to move to Hawaii. Uh, I learned of the opportunity with Miracle Ear. So I started to shadow with him and some of his associates. And that's actually how I met Lisa uh, way back in Michigan before either of us ever lived here in the islands. And um, I studied hard and uh, switched over from, as I mentioned, x-ray CAT scan and polysomnography, actually working with sleep studies, uh, but transitioned over to the hearing side of the world. And uh, Moved out here in 2014 when I opened the very first Miracle Ear location where Lisa currently is working at, uh, at the Nimitz Highway office in Honolulu. Um, and I've been doing it ever since. We've uh, slowly expanded to seven locations throughout the islands. And, you know, I look forward every day to getting up and helping more and more Kapuna throughout the islands and and uh, really having the opportunity to change people's lives. So it's been an interesting journey for me, but one that uh, I wouldn't trade for the world. And, and you are on the big island. That's correct. Yep. I work in our locations that are in Hilo and Kailua Kona. And Lisa, here on, on uh, Oahu. Yes, I am on Oahu. I'm in Honolulu. I'm Nimitz Highway, as you well Excellent. know. And in Excellent. Oahu now, we have several offices. So there are other options other than just traveling to Honolulu if you live out in Kailua or Waipahu, we have service series. Well, I, I thank you both for being here again. And what I generally want to do is, is like to have my viewers come away with some sense of, of how they can evaluate or, or, or assess their own hearing capacity and then how they can respond and follow through to do whatever is helpful in uh, correcting or um, modifying or and enhancing that that auditory experience. But let's first take a look at what is it that happens in our aging process, both emotionally and spiritually, uh, relationally, as well as physically with regard to our hearing senses. Oh, there's a lot. In particular, we're talking about untreated hearing loss. Um, you know, it's not just an issue of the ear. It's it's a 
lifestyle quality that's lacking. And it also affects many other health issues um, that are either exasperated by an untreated hearing loss or uh, the hearing loss is resulting from of some other illnesses, which is quite common. Uh, and, you know, it can, hearing loss is a naturally occurring thing, but it can also be caused by many other things like diabetes. People with diabetes have a, a much higher chance of having hearing loss. Um, so it can be related to a, to a constellation of, of issues, physical issues in, that is in particular. True. One of the other big concerns that we look at when it comes to hearing loss is isolation factors and withdrawal as well. Uh, you know, that's one of the biggest concerns because as we start to age, being active is uh, and still being cognitively healthy and functional is something that we have to try to maintain. And uh, when we start to develop a hearing issue, uh, it's natural to not want to participate in cocktail parties or birthdays or graduation celebrations and other things like that because. If you're not hearing very clearly or very well, then it's it's much more difficult to to participate in those environments. Well, to each of you, I, I ask, would that be the same for somebody losing their sight? It can be, but even Helen Keller herself stated that the auditory perception is the larger of the two deficits that she perceived to be more valuable um, because communication is the way that we we function together, you know, and so seeing is one thing. Uh, but hearing quite essentially is another. Sound travels. I come out. Go ahead, Lisa. What? Uh, sound travels. You can hear something around the corner or in another room or outside. You can see what's in front of you. You, you have a much greater sense of your environment if you can hear. And your brain needs those sounds to stay active in that area, all sound. And it's yeah. 90 to 95% of people with hearing loss can be treated with hearing aids. Unfortunately, that's not what's going on. There's about 38 million people in the United States with hearing loss and about 20, 25% are actually treated for that loss. I think uh, when I came in, first, 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 first auditory test I had, <clears throat> the person who took it said, did you listen to a lot of concerts when you were a kid? There's all so, yeah. Go ahead, Rob. <clears throat> well, yeah, most certainly noise exposure is, uh, is a huge factor, environmental things. So it's not just about uh, health conditions that we already have. Um, it's also just part of the natural aging process. So it's not something that we can really avoid. As we age, it's going to happen. Um, and so uh, getting the help that you need to, as soon as you possibly can is also a very crucial factor. It's a lot like anything else. If you don't use it, you lose it. But unfortunately, these are not nerves that we could ever regrow. You know, So when the damage is done, uh, it's not something that's reversible. So another reason to be proactive and not reactive. Um, another aspect of that is what causes or the atrophy that's related to the brain, you know, same concept. Once it's gone, uh, we can't bring that stuff back. So it's not always just about how we hear. It's also about how our brain is able to process the information that we give it. So another large concern for those that put off getting hearing help uh, for maybe 10 or 15 years in some cases, uh, the atrophy that's occurred to the brain uh, to some level, even when we start to restore sound. Uh, if their brain is no longer able to process that information, then the clarity that they're trying to get may still not necessarily come to light. Would you say that um, that hearing loss is related to dementia? Absolutely. It's an accelerator. Uh, so not something that's going to, per se, give you dementia, but like being overweight makes you more susceptible to heart disease. Uh, same goes to hearing loss with dementia. Untreated hearing loss is up to five times more likely to happen and, and result in dementias than treated hearing loss. So, um, statistic, if you have hearing loss that's not treated, it's up to five times more likely 
that the individual will have some type of Alzheimer's or dementia. That is such a significant uh, number. <clears throat> so any, any family member who has an aging parent, Kabuna, would be wise to make sure their, their uh, hearing is tested regularly. Absolutely. It's recommended by 60 years old, actually, you know, or even 55 in some cases, depending on which studies that you read. But um, definitely something that the sooner you start to at least be aware uh, of where you are, maybe that, that is, do you actually have a loss, but at least be aware of where you are uh, on the chart and, and what is in relation to normal. Excellent. So, so that's good advice. Good being aware, being aware of context, surrounding environment, and how it contributes to to um, to, to the hearing loss is important as well. That's great. And on a self-assessment level, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, please, Robert, continue. That's yeah. On, on a self-assessment level, some of the things that I try to have patients look for specifically is. You know, how many times are we accused of mumbling, you know, or that everybody mumbles? Um, I, my hearing is fine. People just need to articulate or maybe not talk quite as fast. Um, typically, those are signs that they are indeed missing parts of what's being said. And therefore, uh, maybe the patient or the, the individual they're talking to is not actually mumbling. It's just the way they're perceiving what they're hearing. Uh, or if you start to notice things, very subtle stuff, like one common thing that people notice when they first wear their hearing aids is they can hear their feet when they walk, you know, uh, or turn signals in their cars. And, you know, there's a lot of little things in the environment that we just don't notice aren't there anymore because they're so subtle to begin with uh, that your brain really just starts to or you just dismiss the fact that they're there. Uh, and ringing in the ears is also something that a lot of people dismiss as uh, just it is, you know, from noise exposure or something, which is often the case, but it is also a big red flag for having some high frequency hearing loss. Um, and of course, now that we all wear face masks, you know, this is something that has made even mild hearing losses that much more uh, evident because we all do a very small portion of lip reading when we don't necessarily understand something in its entirety. Um, and so if we find that we can't really hear and understand unless people are looking at us, well, there's another indicator that maybe there's something going on. Oh, ringing in the ear. Uh, how often are we seen as misunderstanding or missing phrases? Um, high pitches that we don't, don't notice. And um, not being able to hear without seeing the person Correct. speak. I'm a theater. I was a theater major in college, and one of the things we always said um, to our technical people was, "If you can't see, if you can't see the actor, you cannot hear the actor." And so, it's important. It was always so important to light, light the uh, faces of the actors adequately, so that people could hear, the audience could hear. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, tinnitus you're just, you've described a little bit. Is that correct, Robert? You touched on tinnitus or tinnitus. Yeah, yeah. Tinnitus, tinnitus. Tomato, what's, what's tomato. The cure? <laughs> what's the cure for tinnitus? Uh, well, hearing aids in a lot of cases, but there really is no cure for it. You know, that's something that, again, uh, to to be understood is we can't ever really make the signal go away. Uh, but with hearing devices, there's both tinnitus management therapy inside, so we can essentially present you with a sound that is more tolerable than whatever the, the noise is that you hear to preoccupy your brain, because it's actually a neurological symptom. It's not really coming from your ear. And so when we are able to do that, we're kind of playing the sleight of hand. We're so, sort of tricking the brain into not having to manifest the signal that it makes on its own by giving it something to focus on otherwise. Uh, but the same rule applies mm -hmm. when we start to uh, give you the ability to notice those sounds that you were missing. In, uh, and so therefore, by wearing the hearing aids and, again, being able to start to hear things like your turn signal and your feet on the ground and birds chirping and other things like cars driving by and being more aware of what's around you uh, gives <laughs> your brain the ability to actually relax itself. And therefore, the tinnitus typically will start to organically get better. Yeah, that's amazing. That is truly amazing how the body adapts. Anything to add, Lisa? Um, 
on that one? Uh, no, other than the fact that scientifically, when you present two identical tones at the same time, which is what the hearing aid does, and the brain is making that sound because there is no sound there, which is what Robert just said. But if you print to present them at exactly the same time, there is no sound. And that's what the hearing aid does, or a tinnitus masker, which is we have built into our instruments today just for that reason. Good. I'm wondering what are some of the barriers, emotional barriers, perhaps, that you encounter in people who for the first time come to you and, and recognize that they have hearing loss. By emotional barriers, do you mean how do they feel? I, I think- Emotional barriers. Emotional- Sorry, go ahead. Adults with untreated hearing loss are more, and Rob touched on this earlier, are more likely to report being depressed, having anxiety, um, paranoia thoughts, much more common than people with hearing loss that wear hearing aids. They don't, they, they suffer. It's emotionally stressful. Stressful is a bad thing for anybody. They're a circle of people. <coughs> they can't understand them. And there, it's, it gets to be a very vicious cycle. And with the emotions, it's emotion to that circle. Spouses, family members, friends all have a part of it, own it. You have to raise your voice. You're out in public with your dad and you got to yell at him to get him to understand you. And then he wonders why you're mad at him. That's an emotionally stressful environment for everybody. It's toxic. Thank you for that that illustration. That's very helpful. Any more to add to that, Robert? It's you know, it's that kind of stuff. Or typically speaking, you know, they've either embarrassed themselves in a situation, or potentially even almost hurt themselves or somebody else, maybe driving a car and didn't hear an ambulance coming or something to that effect. You know, um, so there's definitely an emotional aspect to hearing loss, and and. Sometimes I use the analogy, it's like bad breath. You're the last person to know that you have it as well, you know? And so that's another concept is that you have to really try to wrap your head around what the people have been dealing with or going through. And, and, and sometimes they don't even know it, you know? And so it's, it's also having to try to, you know, open them up and, and break down the barriers to get them to really discuss what's been going on or what maybe they have or haven't been noticing. And uh, it is ironic how, in some cases, the you know the loved ones are saying, "No, you you have a problem," and then in their case, they just don't necessarily perceive it. So, through the testing procedure, uh, you know, we're not necessarily trying to point out that pre people have an issue, you know, but there are ways to help slowly ease them into the idea that maybe it is in fact their own their own issue that they have to deal with, you know. Um, but so emotionally, and that's really what we want to try to capture is the idea that, you know, there, there's more to life than just throwing in the towel, you know, and that certainly is what we don't want to ever see happen. So when someone comes into Miracle Lear, the first thing that they get from you is a welcome. And, and a, a great big smile. smile. <laughs> <laughs> and a big smile. That's right. And the second thing is a, a discussion. Well, no, we'll lead us through the next thing, and then the next thing, and then the next thing. You want to uh, well, so, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Lisa. I'll let you go ahead and start. Okay. Well, I, there's obviously some paperwork to fill out so that we have some idea of what's going on with them, um, some medical history, how they perceive their loss, how if they have a loved one with them, how they perceive the loss. And I feel that it's very important for a person who has a hearing impairment to understand their loss and to own it and, and try to wrap their head around it that way. But first is understanding and understanding what it represents. And they, you know, if you've got a sensory neural loss, you, you might be able to hear your best bud, you can't hear your wife or your daughter or your grandchildren. And that's the issue of, of actually educating the patient to understand what their loss is. And, and by doing that throughout the course of the testing procedure, I find that people are, are pretty open when we're all done and are, are 
are ready to try a hearing aid. Another big aspect, and, and I think what separates us and what we do better than most is, like Lisa had mentioned, educate. That's first and foremost what we want our patients to understand is not necessarily just do they need a hearing aid or don't they, uh, but exactly what's happening in their hearing loss and why particular technologies may be more effective for them versus other technologies, even when it comes to style, you know, in the ear versus over the ear. Uh, we really try to be that, uh, that solution for every single issue that you're having and, uh, and really walk your hand, walk you through and guide you through this process because it truly is a lifestyle change as well. It becomes something that, uh, you know, it takes, there's a learning curve, you know, the amount of time that some people take to just learn how to put the hearing aid in correctly is, is different for everybody, you know, uh, even how we perceive sound is different. Uh, so two people with similar hearing losses, uh, we program hearing aids, they aren't necessarily going to sound the same for every individual. And so doing protocol like speech mapping um, is something that is necessary, not just something that should be done, you know, for the sake of doing it, but it's really what helps us ensure that the patient is getting the benefit from their devices that they should always be getting as well. Uh, no throwing darts at the wall, if you will. Uh, we like to make sure that everything is done correctly. And what kind of information do you get from that auditory test, sitting in the soundproof cube and, and uh, listening to all the headset? Well, that really is just giving us a painting a picture of as if you were to go down and have your eyes tested, we need to find out necessary, you know, what your prescription is, if you will. So that, that gives us a baseline to initially tune the devices. Uh, but everybody's ear canals are different shapes and sizes. And so therefore, like a, a big room versus a little room, sound reverberates differently uh, based on those kind of characteristics. And so that's, you know, the initial testing is really just a very small part of what's necessary to fit the hearing aid correctly. That's excellent. Thank you very much. I, we only have, we have five minutes left. Left. One of our viewers has asked the question: What makes Miracle Ear special compared to other hearing aids? In a nutshell, it's our technology. Um, it's capable of doing things that other technologies are not. Um, our ability to adjust the devices is much more elaborate than a lot of the other technologies out there. So because Miracle Ear only deals with one specific brand, um, our software is very unique in the way that we have access to adjusting the devices. And uh, with that being said, we're constantly being trained on technology changes within not just the industry, but with our tech or with our products themselves. And so when, uh, if you're, ABC hearing and you sell, you know, 10 different types of hearing aids or 10 different brands. Well, now that's 10 or more different things that you actually have to be adapted to learning and understanding if, you know, your patients are using different kinds of technologies. Um, so in, in my opinion, that just makes it a little more confusing. But, uh, but the reality is, is, you know, I have not met a person yet that wears competitive hearing aids that when I put our hearing aids in, they don't say they sound better, you know. So the proof the really comes in the fact that they just do sound better. Yeah. Now the technology of the instruments, the technology of the support system, the technology of, of uh, <clears throat> tuning them up. May I? I'm going to use a quick, quick view of, of my hearing aids, if I may. Absolutely. <laughs> this oh, one's like in my that. right ear, and, and the one in my left ear looks the same. Yep. And I had another, I had another previous to these, had another brand. Lisa fitted me with these and she has worked with me twice, several times to fit, 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 to fit them. <clears throat> and then there's this little device, which is a, um, a Bluetooth, which connects this little device directly to my hearing aid. <laughs> And I have so much fun with this. I can't tell you how much, how much fun with this. Sometimes I, I go places and I turn on my Bluetooth and um, I listen to the to what I have programmed in my phone because it's more interesting than what's going on out in the yep, community absolutely. that I'm walking in. Otherwise, this can also amplify from the environment. 
directly yep, serves to as my... a remote microphone. Yeah, that's a microphone. So I said to my uh, my girlfriend, really, what I ought to do is give this to her so that she can go walk across the house and still be in touch. <laughs> Yeah, I always tell my patients, well, we reserve learning how to use the spy gear until week two or three, usually, you know, so. <laughs> Remarkable devices. And uh, just take it from me, viewers, it's, it's a whole new world. And to have these hearing aids and to have this supplementation of my hearing ability. <clears throat> and I love it so much. We have one minute left. Is there any last thing you'd like to say, either, both of you, from either of you? I would like to say, you know, I've, I've fit hearing aids for the majority of my life at this point. And if somebody tried a hearing aid five years ago and said, oh, I just didn't like it. I took it back. They should try again. Technology has made its huge impact on us. It, it really has. Yeah, I couldn't agree with Lisa what she just said anymore. You know, technology has made leaps and bounds in the last five to seven years, and that has made a huge impact on how how well and how effectively we're able to help, especially the more challenging hearing losses in the world. Um, but uh, but the bottom line is, is as we mentioned earlier, you can't do this stuff soon enough. You know, so if you have a problem, try not to ignore it. Um, and the sooner you act, the happier you're going to be in the long run. That's a guarantee. And, uh, and again, just thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to get on here and to speak about something that I know I'm very passionate about, and I know Lisa is as well. And, uh, you know, we really are blessed to be able to help people every day and uh, just just grateful for that opportunity. My, my mission is to help people form a, a extraordinary elderhoods because I know it can be the richest time of life. And hearing, and do you hear what I hear? Hearing that, as the rest of the world does, <clears throat> makes a huge difference in extraordinary elderhood. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining with us. Lisa Sales, Robert Tuzanyat, Tuzanyat, <laughs> and uh, on, on Oahu and on, um, and on the Big Island and other islands throughout. Join me again in two weeks, and we'll have another progressive show about uh, making your elderhood extraordinary. And go to our website, if you will, and during our spring fundraiser, contribute a few bucks, quite a few bucks, in fact, instead of <laughs> a lot of dollars, and uh, to keep us going here at Think Tech Hawaii and providing the wonderful exposure to the community life that they do. Looking forward to seeing you and welcoming you back in two weeks. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs>